What does the Bible have to offer? Both the Christian and Judaic worldviews use the Bible, or at least parts of the Bible, to form the basis of what truth is. It is the center of both Christians and Jews' moral reasoning. However, in contrast to the views brought by the Bible, the lived experience of the oppressed is what defines truth in today's social climate. Now this opens up the question, is truth objective? You may have heard terms being used such as lived experience or your truth. Social justice warriors are seeking to redefine our society through the lens of the lived experience of the oppressed. While invalidating people who have lived experience from the so-called dominant perspective, if you are viewed to be successful in the radically changing society of today, your truth, unfortunately, is invalid. Let's look at what Martin Luther King Jr. had to say. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. How many steps backwards are being taken with a false sense of moving forward? This quote and what is going on in the world today is an example of how we as humans fail to see objective morality. If we are the authors of truth and morality, then why do we see such turmoil today over this very issue? Truth has to be objective. If the truths found in the Bible were subjective, this means that the rules and outlines that the Bible expresses would be malleable and changeable depending on our reaction and feeling towards them. In a sense, we would be molding the Bible to fit into our already established lives. What the Bible pushes for is a transformation of life, from old to new. With objective truth, we have no option but to accept it as reality. Of course, everyone has the option to choose. Not accepting what the Bible says is true will lead, unfortunately, to self-deception. Then you are relying on yourself to determine between right and wrong. And who is to say that your version of right and wrong is the right right and the wrong wrong? Or is it the right wrong? See, this is the problem with subjective morality. Someone else will have a view that will oppose what your worldview is. And who is to say which is right or which is wrong, unless there is an outside, objective truth that we are able to attribute to our moral reasoning. Now, some of you may disagree with my next statement. Humans are inherently bent for wrong. By nature, we are selfish creatures and not selfless. We have to teach children to share and how to be kind. It is inherent for a child to snatch and steal and have selfish attributes. Naturalism seeks to justify and reward the self-centered life of an individual. The theory of natural selection and survival of the fittest seeks to authorize the idea that a selfish and self-centered lifestyle is a product of our past generations. And to succeed in life, you must put yourself first and everyone else last. Now, how does this marry to morality? It is interesting because the Bible says in Jeremiah that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? How often are we told in life to follow your heart? Now, the Bible is telling us the completely opposite thing, that we can't trust our heart. Let's see what else the Bible has to say about our nature. In Romans, it says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If I then do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I hope you 
stayed with me there. Um, now, what exactly is the Bible trying to get us to change from? What is it that we are petitioned to overcome? We are now introduced to the idea of sin and the effect that it has on us as human beings. We see here that Paul, the writer, is battling against himself, that the things he desires not to do, which is the evil or the sin, he ends up doing. And what he desires to do, the good, he doesn't do. Now, I don't know about you, but I know in my life, if it was as simple as desiring to do the good things, and that my actions would then follow my desires to be good, then I think that everyone who desires to be a better person in the world would simply just be a better person. But unfortunately, that isn't the case. Before I even catch myself, I've already done the exact thing I was trying not to do. So now we have been presented with a problem here. This is what the Bible and Christians call sin. Paul takes it to another level and says that the sin that is in us is what makes us to do the bad things. So how do we get this sin out of us? How do we even identify what is inside of us as sin? Using the Bible as our objective truth, let's see if it has the answers. In Romans 7, 7, it says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. We see here in Romans that the law of God is there for us to identify sin. It shows us what is right and what is wrong. But we have a problem now. If we are able to identify sin through the law, but we aren't able to change ourselves because of the sin that is in us, making us do wrong, how do we become good? The Bible has this concept of being born again. How do we become reborn? For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So it is our faith in God that helps us overcome the temptations of sin. Now, to be honest with you, it can all sound a bit abstract and foreign. What does having faith in God even look like? To put it as simply as I can, if you ask your partner, your husband or your wife to take out the garbage, you then trust that they have done it and you believe that the next time you go to put something in the bin, that there will be a clean bag with no trash in it. If God gives us a promise in the Bible telling us that he promises to help us overcome temptation, then I now believe that the next time I get tempted, that God will give me a way of escape and also the strength to say no. If he says it, then I believe it. And most importantly, I trust that he has already done it for me. God removes the garbage out of our lives. When we confess our sins to him, we then go and put more trash back into our lives. So the cycle goes on and on and on until we learn what things we do that will create trash and the things that won't. God helps us see those things through trusting in Him and one day, because He promises, we won't be putting any more trash into our lives. Now let that all digest. The Bible is the basis of truth. We are inherently selfish. There is a thing called sin and we need a faith in God to overcome sin. Now you're asking yourself, how can I trust the Bible or how do I get faith? These are some things we'll be exploring in future videos. Let me leave you with a promise from God. In Romans 12, 3, it says, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith.